You are listening to the Outside the Boards podcast. I'm Daniel Leary. For most of my professional career, I have worked in mainstream sports for some of the world's leading sports organizations and properties and blue chip brands, helping to create award-winning omni-channel marketing campaigns, result-driven sales strategies, and impactful brand building initiatives. But all that work doesn't compare to the fun, excitement, and challenges I've been fortunate to experience working for the king of all sports, Polo. For nearly a decade, I've put my heart and ambition into helping advance the sport of polo. I've made lifelong friendships, met some incredible people, traveled to memorable polo destinations, and heard the craziest stories. My goal is to share these people, places, and stories with you and provide a unique behind-the-scenes perspective of the game that breaks all the common stereotypes, all while discussing key issues affecting the sport today and the constructive sharing of ideas, insights, solutions, and best case studies for the purpose of advancing polo globally. Every week, I will have honest conversations with polo industry leaders, enthusiasts, and awe-inspiring people who make this sport great and fun to be around. I hope through their knowledge and their unique perspectives, they will motivate and inspire you. Together, we will explore ways you can make small tweaks to boost your polo business, whether you are a club, event, team, or player, that will amount to big changes in revenue, participation, attendance, and exposure. Saddle up. Welcome to Outside the Boards with me, Daniel Lear. Daniel Leary here, and welcome to Season 2 of the Outside the Boards podcast. Hope you're all continuing to have a great start to the new year. High Go Polo continues in the United States. I hope you are all continuing to tune in to Global Polo TV and Chucker TV to watch all the High Goal action. On this episode of Outside the Boards, and after multiple failed attempts due to technical difficulties, I am thrilled to welcome women's polo rising star, Hope Ariano. Born in Wellington, Florida, Ariano spent spring and fall each year in Aiken, South Carolina, where her family owns a horse farm. Clearly, riding is an Ariano obsession. Her father is a professional polo player, her mother played while she was pregnant with Hope, and she and her two brothers started riding at a very young age. By age six, Hope was swinging a mallet. Despite her youth, Hope was already racking up a slew of accomplishments including become the youngest winner ever at the 2017 U.S. Open Women's Polo Championship at the Houston Polo Club, being named most valuable player at the women's tournament at the Villages Polo Club in Villages, Florida, and winning the 12-goal USPA Pete Bostwick Memorial Tournament with her two brothers and father. At age 18, she now plays in low, medium, and high goal matches in both mixed and women's tournaments. She also travels all around the country. This is what Hope Ariano's life looks like as one of today's most active female players in American polo. In 2021, Hope would play in the Yugoslocker Cup, play in the World Polo League, and the Butler Handicap at Port Mayaka Polo Club. But the biggest highlight would be joining the La Irianita team competing in the Women's Argentine Open. Hope is smart, beautiful, and a force in women's polo. I'm thrilled to have had the opportunity to get to know her, and I'm excited to see her play and continue her streak as one of the world's top female players. So let's get started, everyone. Enjoy. Hope Ariano, it is so good to have you back again. And when I say back for everyone who's listening, Hope and I have attempted to do this podcast on multiple occasions. <laughs> we tried to do it when you're in Argentina, technical difficulties. We tried to do it <laughs> just the other week. And again, technical difficulties. And that was on my end. First one was on your end with internet connection and so on and so forth. Her second one is on my end. So we're finally here. Good morning to everyone. Seven o'clock here in Illinois. We just had a nice two inch snowfall overnight and I will be outside snow blowing and getting the snow off my car. I bet it's beautiful down there in Florida now, right? Oh, it's really, really pretty. Um, it's nice and chilly. So <laughs> thankfully no snow. Okay. But... What is chilly for Florida? It's like 63. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. It's really nice. You Floridans, or <laughs> that's how you pronounce it, dear Lord. Come up here to Chicago. Yeah, they're still playing in arena up here, just so you know. So Really? Yeah. So those guys, I mean, crazy, maybe not for the past two, <laughs> few weeks. It's been pretty brutally cold up here, so they probably just kept the horses warm. For those who are braving and playing winter polo up here, that's for sure, indoors. That's some dedication, definitely. That is serious <laughs> dedication. So no, Hope, it's great to have you back. We've, we've gotten to know each other so well, I feel like. 
with all these problems that were happening. Thank you for having me. And excited to have you on this because you are killing it on the polo field on and off. And you're a rising star. And what? You're 18? Is that right? Yes. I'm 18. You're 18. You're at eight goals, right? Yes. Wow. You're killing it. That's for damn sure. That's for sure. So we we can use profanity on this podcast. Just keep it light. <laughs> so it, it's appropriate to say that you're kicking ass. You're effing awesome. I probably would probably want to refrain from using the F word. But regardless, you are making waves in women's polo and overall polo in just in general. And I'm really excited to talk about your background because you were born, bred, and polo fed polo literally when you're in the womb and I mean, your mom was playing polo while she was about to have you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so give everyone a little bit of background as to who you are and your polo family. For those of you who are tuning in, who, who don't know this 18 year old rock star. So my dad was a professional polo player for a very long time. He was the highest rated American player for a very long time. And my mother always played, she played more for fun. Um, not professionally. And I have two older brothers who also play polo. So the whole family played. <laughs> and what are your siblings names? My oldest brother is Augustine and the middle brother is Lucas. And what goal levels are they at? Lucas is two goals going to three in May and August is three. Got it. Got it. Yes. So yes, it's definitely been in the family the, for a very long time. And did your grandfather, grandmother, you know, play polo as well? I think the last time we spoke, you're what, third generation? Yes. So both of my granddads on either side play polo. And where are you from originally? So I was born in Wellington, Florida, but I mean, we move all the time. Basically, what I call home is Aiken, South Carolina. Um, that's where we have our farm and that's where I believe to be our home. <laughs> got it. Got it. And when you say move around, is it bouncing back from Wellington to Aiken? Or are we talking like military style family where you're just hopping around or migrating to where the polo seasons are, like a surfer would, migrating where the waves are? More migrating where the polo seasons are. I mean, we grew up going to Wyoming, straight in Wyoming for all the summers. Um, and we typically spend spring and fall in Aiken, South Carolina, and then winters here in Florida. So that's kind of the system we've done for a really long time. But I mean, it's basically wherever we get the jobs and wherever the polo takes us. Why Wyoming? I mean, it's beautiful up there. I mean, the flying H and everything is out there. I mean, I, I do hear a lot of people spend their summers and what have you in Wyoming, but why Wyoming? Just out of curiosity, how did that happen? So that's actually exactly is the flying H. My father used to work for Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. um, which are the Johnsons. Yes, yes, yes. And so every summer we would go out there with them. Oh, that's got to be awesome. It, it is beautiful. Wyoming is absolutely stunning. Now, when you went out there, did you start to get really into the outdoors? Are you now a fly fisherman? <laughs> yeah. You know, are you cowboying? Do you know how to rope now? And I feel with Yellowstone and everything like that, but which is Montana. But regardless, I feel like... No, definitely. That was probably the best part about the summers is getting to go hiking and going fishing. And yeah, no, growing up, we used to do the little rodeos, um, like against all the kids. We do the pole bending and the barrel racing. I never picked up roping. I tried roping the dogs, but it didn't go well. So <laughs> <laughs> that was never something I was good at. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I, mean, I feel like there's some natural ability if you're a polo player holding a mallet in one hand to some degree and then trying to rope. You'd think. I'm not sure. You would think. I don't know. <laughs> it didn't work well for me. But I, I have one of those little roping bowls that I have like on my coffee table where you like have to do a little string and you just like toss it over. That's what I do when I'm bored in the office. But th that's great. So a little bit about your father. You see, you know, your father was one of the best American pole players, not back in the day, but I want to say even just recently. Tell us a, a little bit about him. He got up to 10 goals. Is that right? He was a 10 goal polo player? No, he, no, he wasn't. Okay. Nine goals. Nine yeah. goals. Ugh. Nine goals, never 10. So he played for a very long time. He moved here when he was seven years old. Um, he moved to Wellington from Nicaragua. And yeah, he said that he instantly fell in love with polo and his father played. So I'm assuming he moved with his family from Nicaragua to the United States, and yeah. that's where his father picked up polo as well, or had his father had played in Nicaragua? 
I think his father played a little bit in Nicaragua as well. Okay, okay. You know, I've heard Nicaragua had a polo scene from other people too. I forget the person who I last spoke to who had played out there. I believe there. that they do. I think that it's just a very small club. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, what are some of his accolades that you're in the shadow of? I mean, U.S. Open, what are some of the tournaments that he has played in or won? No, he's been very fortunate. He's won a lot of the the well-known tournaments here in the States, which is absolutely incredible. And he actually was able to go to Argentina and play the Open there. And so they didn't do so well in that tournament, but it was still the experience was something incredible. But no, he's amazing after his accident, which happened three years ago, he's now become a coach. So he's been coaching a lot and he's coaching a lot of the high goal teams. And so that's kind of how it's going now. But no, it's amazing to have him to be able there to help coach me as well. So Yeah. And now your mom, she's a polo player as well. Was she playing women's professional polo or was she just, you know, amateur, more recreational than... So my mom, she didn't play professionally. She played more for fun. Yeah. I mean, we grew up playing with her and she would help like make my dad's green horses and help him out in practices. Women's polo back then wasn't as big as it is now. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, women's polo every year is getting bigger and bigger and the growth in it is absolutely incredible. I think back then the women's polo was more of like a weekend every now and then the boyfriends and the husbands would just pass their horses and let their wives or girlfriends go out and just have a good time, you know? Sounds a little bit like golf in a way too. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we grew up playing with her. And as I told you last time we spoke, I always joked that my first memory of polo was that I was in her stomach and her doctor had told her that she wasn't allowed to play anymore. (laughs) <laughs> but she was in the finals of a women's tournament. And so she did it anyway. She was like, what's one more game, you know? Yeah. And her doctor, who has never been to a polo game, showed up to that game and watched her play. <laughs> and Man. so apparently she got in a little bit of trouble for it. But <laughs> he's probably she, thinking, you know, that kid's going to be doing great things. That's, that's for sure. I don't know. About yeah, the that. prophecy has come true. No. So they always joked that they cheated because they had five girls on the team. I think the slogan for this podcast is going to be baptized in polo. Hope. I love it. Yeah. So I I think that might be appropriate. Aside from being in your mom's tummy while she's playing in a tournament, when (laughs) were you officially on horseback for the first time? Do you remember? I mean, it's got to be at an age where you probably... I don't even remember, to be honest. I was fortunate enough to have a really, really cool uh, horse from actually from Wyoming, um, a cow horse. And he was an old rodeo horse, I guess I should say. Yeah. But yeah, so he took me around everywhere. He was my first horse. And yeah, I ridden forever. When I was about six or seven, that's kind of when I started like really sick and balling and stuff like that. And when I was about eight or nine is when I decided that polo is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Your parents were adamant about yeah do you want polo to be your career or do you have the door open for secondary options and things like that is that right yes so exactly so my parents I mean they wanted me to do anything besides polo and not because polo is a bad sport I mean it's the best sport that's what we all love but back in that time it was definitely not where it is at for women's polo right now Mm -hmm. I mean the opportunity to be a woman's pro was very slim yeah And you have Sunny Hale, who pioneered the way for women's polo and made the growth is incredible right now. You can now go around and have a full season of women's polo. And I mean, it's grown so much. And so I think my parents, I mean, I played tennis when I was younger. I was a little cheerleader. I mean, I did, I did a lot of activities, but nothing came close to the way I felt when I played polo. And that's what really drew me to that. And so my parents always said that they would support us with whatever we chose Mm -hmm. to do. And so that's what I chose. (laughs) And you're right. I mean, in the past, my gosh, even past three years, women's polo has skyrocketed. It's got the same high profile matches that the men do. And it keeps on skyrocketing. I mean, even up here in Chicago, you know, people are begging, you know, we got to put a a women's tournament on the Oprah polo field. And Oprah has a lot of great history with women's polo with, you know, Jory Butler Kent, you know, being one of the first women to be recognized as a member of the United States Polo Association 50 years ago along with Sunny Hale's mother, Sue Sally Hale, who was a regular up here in Illinois in the Lake Bluff area. 
those two were also pioneers and leading the way for women's polo. And I know Jory was a, one of the few patrons, women patrons in the sport too, with her husband at that time, Joffrey Kent, who owned Amber Crombie and Kent, uh, the luxury travel company. So yeah, so so much has happened in women's polo. It's 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 super exciting. Not to mention the horse is the great equalizer, and you know, you see a lot of uh, you know battle of the sexes and you know women on men's teams without question. Yeah. Jim Jury, my boss, you know, a lot of the times, you know, when he has to come out of the game for whatever reason, it's not uncommon for a women's polo player to to swoop right in and take his spot. Grace yeah. Mudra has done it. Pamela Flanagan has done it. You know, Jenna Davis has done it. They can play with the best of them and sometimes even better than the men in a lot of instances. But and you guys make it so fun to watch on the pole field. That's for sure. You, I think you have you guys uh, provide a little bit more glitz and glamour <laughs> out there. And I think you can actually suppress your anger, I think, a little bit more than men can. You know, not so much profanity out on the field. That's for sure, especially <laughs> in Spanish. But no, that's fantastic. So when did you get uh, your first handicap? So I started playing kids tournaments yeah. and, you know, as everyone starts out as a minus one, mm -hmm. I want to say I was probably nine when I got my first handicap. So nine, you got your first handicap. Was that a negative one or did you just automatically bump up into one or two? No, I started as a minus one. Minus one. All right. So within nine years that we're talking, you know, you're skyrocketing up eight goals. When do you feel that your polo career started to really, really take off? At what age were you? I feel like I took it very slow because I was very small for a really long time. And so my parents always kept me from playing big tournaments because they wanted me to be strong enough okay. to be able to, you know, compete with the big guys because, yeah, they're always going to look out for you. But it's also, it's a game. People are getting paid. You're not supposed to rely on them to watch out for your kid. You yeah. Know? yeah, 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 yeah. So I think I was, I'm trying to remember, I think I was about 10 when I played my first tournament, like my first real mixed tournament. <laughs> and I think of what the hell I was doing when I was 10 years old. You're out there playing tournament on a thousand pound animal. Just goes to show again how badass youth polo players are. So when you're 10 years old in your first tournament, do you recall what handicap you were at? Oh, I think I was probably zero at that point. You're still zero. Okay, got it. Yeah, and at that point, women's handicaps hadn't even come out. Oh, okay. All right. So that was a mixed rating. Gotcha. Gotcha. All and right. Sunny Hale um, and a group of girls created the women's handicaps. Sunny Hale, Joyce Nicholas, and everything. So. Okay. All right. So when that occurred, and obviously your game was assessed and so on and so forth, what did they put you at? And do you remember how old you were when that happened? I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I do remember that I was instantly a two in women's polo. Okay. And then if that was like what you're 13 or 14 years old and then since then has you just you, you've added another handicap goal you know to your game you know following that until now you're 18 were you just recently bumped up to an eight yes so in june i was bumped up to eight okay all right so you've been jumping up a handicap almost every year that's fantastic thank My you gosh. i appreciate it now how many women's polo players are rated at your level between eight and 10? All around the world or just in America? Just in America. So in America, I'm actually the highest rated women's player right now. Unbelievable. So I'm the only eight goaler and then there is six and under. Or no, it's seven, I believe. Okay. We have one seven goaler and then the rest are six and under. And then throughout the world? Throughout the world, it probably has to be top 10, I think. Okay. Isn't that nuts that there's like, you can count the best of the best on two hands? It's crazy. <laughs> it's like 10 goalers. Like you can count them all on 10 hands. That's it. Like you could only have one 40 goal match. <laughs> exactly. Literally. And in women's polo, there's only two 10 goaler female players. Um, and who are those individuals? Nina Clarkin and Hazel Jackson. So both English players. This podcast episode is presented by the Gay Polo League. The Gay Polo League is the only LGBTQ polo organization in the world that is dedicated to producing high-end LGBTQ polo events and experiences. 
Its mission is to inspire and empower those individuals who identify themselves as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender via the promotion of and participation in the sport of polo. The GPL promotes the sport of polo to provide equality, pride, inclusion, and confidence for those individuals who face discrimination simply due to identifying themselves as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or other non-traditional sexual or gender identities. GPL works to create an atmosphere that affirms and supports the understanding and acceptance of all individuals regardless of race, sex, or sexual identity and works to promote goodwill and camaraderie in the community. Its ongoing goal is to raise money at GPL events to help LGBTQ organizations better serve their communities. Our battle cry is, the slightest difference makes all the difference. GPL is changing perceptions in the LGBT community, athletics, and society at large, one chucker at a time. In 2022, the GPL was awarded the Champion of Equity and Diversity in Sports, awarded by the Palm Beach County Sports Commission. We invite you to join us. For more information about the organization, its events, and how to donate, please visit www.gaypolo.com. So from 13 to 18, you have had a very, very fast trajectory in this game. Between then, who have you played for during that time period? What were some of the teams? I've been so fortunate to play with many really, really great teams. For women's polo, I've gotten to play with Sen Sabo, who's Don Jones's team. And I played with her in my first U.S. Women's Open. And we were able to win that, which was really, really neat. And then I played for Dundas, who is Sarah Magnus, who is an absolute amazing lady who I've really enjoyed playing for. And and no, I've played for, for many teams that I'm so fortunate to have gotten the opportunities to play for. Santa Clara here in Wellington. I played an 18 goal last year with them and in mixed ratings, which was really cool. And yeah, many, many teams that I'm so <laughs> grateful for. In the last five years, is there any particular tournament that really stands out that you are thrilled to play in? In the U.S., let's in set the aside the, okay. the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. I feel like that's another topic in itself. I think my absolute favorite tournament was a few years back, we did, my father, my two older brothers, and myself played a 12 goal in Aiken, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time of all of us playing together, all four of us, and we were able to win it, which we played as a 10 goal team. So that was really, really neat for us. And that was the only time we were able to play tournament all four together. Yeah, that had to have been a lot of fun. It was pretty, pretty cool. And then last year here, I was able to play a lot of high goal mixed polo, which was really neat for me. I was able to play in the 18 goal and then substitute a few times in the 18 in IPC and in the 22. So that was something that was really special as well. Yeah. Who are you uh, substituting for in the 22 and for what tournaments? So I was able to play at over at World Polo League with Nero. This okay. time I wasn't substituting. So it was with Juan Martin Nero, Juan Martin Zubia, and Grant Gansey. Mm-hmm. And then the 18 goal, I played with Santa Clara, with Francisco Escobar, and Luis Escobar. Okay. So that was really cool for me. Yes, and so here in IPC, I played with Luis Escobar as well. Man, that's great. That's great. World Polo League. And I mean, that that's awesome, man. In demand for the, the men's polo scene as well. So you've also played in the Women's Open, right? Yes. So I started in 2017 was my first year playing the Women's Open and I've played in it ever since. And how did you do in the Women's Opens? So I won the first one I ever played with Don Jones. And then I've played with Sarah Magnus. They changed it to used to be in Texas and they actually moved it here in Wellington and they moved the date to March to make it a little more appealing for everyone to be during the high goal season here in Wellington. Yeah. And so, and yeah, I haven't won it since, but <laughs> it's been really great. One in itself is an accomplishment. So it's. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so I've gotten to play with Sarah for two years now. And then the year before that I played with Hazel Jackson and Jillian Johnston and Ronnie Duke. So it's been really a great experience every year. And now your career has taken you overseas and you've been playing in Argentina for what, the past few years? Just recently, right? 
Yeah, so I've been to Argentina before, and I had just played practices there. Mm-hmm. And then this past year that I just got back, actually, I was playing the Women's Argentine Open, which was my first time playing tournament there. So it was absolutely incredible. I mean, I can't say one bad thing about it. Honestly, the whole experience there was amazing. And who did you play for? I played for La Anita, who is an organization run by the McDonough's. So Matias McDonough and Pablo McDonough. Ah, uh, okay. Who are your teammates? I played with Fatima Barasano, Milagro Sanchez, and Izzy Parsons. So we were a really young team, but I mean, it was the first time of all of us playing together and everything just clicked. I mean, it was a really, really cool experience. Now, the Women's Open down there is relatively new too. It's only been around for a few years as well, right? Yes. I believe it's been three or four years. So okay. very, very new still. And how many teams competed in it? There were eight teams this year. Eight teams. Okay. How'd you guys do? We ended up winning the subsidiary finals. Okay. So, yes, we lost our semifinals to the team who ended up winning it. Okay. Got it. Got it. Wait, so subsidiary finals, what? So that's third place, technically? Or yes. Okay. Yep, exactly. <laughs> got it. Well, that's fantastic. That had to have been a hell of an experience. So now you've yeah, obviously, yeah. you've broken the international barrier. Now you do have plans playing down there again or even elsewhere in other countries in the UK at all? Or So as of right now, nothing in the UK. I've played before. Um, I went and represented the US in the Junior Westchester Cup, the same year mm-hmm. that my dad went and uh, represented the US. And so that was a really neat experience. And I love the UK. I mean, I would love to go back there again. But as of Argentina, I will be going back again in the fall season. And we're going to be playing with the same team. Wonderful. Now, is it true that the Federation of International Polo, are they creating their own World Cup of Women's Polo too? Is that finally being done? Yes. So I believe that they're trying to get that worked out. Um, I just, when I was in Argentina, I played the Copa de Naciones, Mm -hmm. which was a sort of FIPs. We played against England and Argentina. So I think that they're wanting to make it a more regular thing and really just improve that. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of what the goal level might be and would that affect you at all? Because, I mean, you're you're one of the highest rated players in the world. And sometimes, you know, for those world championships, the highest rated polo players kind of get knocked out a little bit. Yeah, at least for the men's. It's not like you're seeing Adolfo Cambiasso and some of those guys playing because if they did, then they would be with a bunch of lower goal people players. Yeah. Exactly. No, for so for the mixed, they cap it out at six goals. I think you're not allowed to be six goals. Okay. And then for the women's, I don't think they've decided yet. I'm unsure a hundred percent. But when I played it this year and well in Argentina, Hazel Jackson was on the English team and Leah Salvo was on the Argentine team, which is two of the best women in the world. So I'm not sure what they're gonna do in the future for it. But um I think they are working out some big plans for it, which is very exciting. Now, the women's handicap system in the United States, has that been adopted in other countries or they're still working off of their general handicap system? No. So the women's handicap, every place has their own, Okay, but it is all around. So when I go to Argentina, I have a new handicap there, mm-hmm. but it still is women's rating. It still is a women's rating. Is the methodology kind of the same or? Pretty much the same. It's just it's like the mixed rating. When you go to Argentina, you have a different mixed rating than you do here. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is just kind of my opinion a little bit. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the handicap system appears to be a relatively subjective number attached. Would you say so? I mean, is there really a definitive methodology or algorithm to determine one's handicap? No, I, I agree with you. I think it's, a, it's a definitely a really hard job mm-hmm. having to do that. And I think it comes down to honestly what opportunities you've been given that year, what you were able to play, what horses you're being mounted on. You know, mm-hmm. it, it all depends on the year that you've had. Yeah. And the horse obviously plays such a critical part of your game. Yes. You know, you don't want to have be on a bad that. string or anything. No, exactly. And I think that's the big deal also when you go overseas is how you're observed on those horses, you know? Yeah. When you went down to Argentina, did you bring your own horses down? I did not. So Matias Magrini uh, mounted me while I was there. And I was very fortunate to be on his horses. They mm-hmm. were all really, really nice. So yeah, so I had a great time on those horses. Got it. 
And speaking of strings, how many are on your string or how many horses does your family have here in the U.S.? Oh, too many. Too many. <laughs> Our family all in total is too many. <laughs> is it in the hundreds or? Uh, no, no, no. Probably all together is like 60s. Somewhere okay. In there. That's good. Is your family in the business of breeding and training? Yes. So we're not fully into it, but a few of my dad's retired horses, we've decided to breed because, you know, they were just so incredible and that we'd want to see how their babies turn out. And so, I mean, we've done two a year, you know, and okay. so now we have a few, we bred once like five all in one year. And so now they're, they're becoming two mm -hmm. this year. And so they'll be broke and we'll get to see how they work, which is really neat. Now, how many ponies do you have in your string that you take around with you? So here in Wellington, I brought 15. Okay. Who are some of your faves? Some of my favorites. Oh, that's always the hardest question. I know. I love them all for different reasons. But I think a few of my all-time favorites is Hippie Chick, who was one of my dad's mares. And he actually passed her down to me. So she's very special to me. And she's just absolutely incredible. I mean, to play the high goal for him and then to come play everything from women's polo to whatever I'm playing at the moment. I mean, she's still always my best. And then Peppermint Patty, who was purchased from Owen Reinhardt, who was a former Tangle player, and he's got a great breeding operation in Aiken, South Carolina, not far from our farm. Mm -hmm. And then Milkshake is probably my other favorite. <laughs> Milkshake, Peppermint Patty, and Hippie Chick. That sounds like the next names of girl scout cookies i think that's a good one i think hippie chick would take you know the top spot i don't know what would be included yeah. in that cookie at all i love it that's great i have 17 nephews and nieces that's including my own children and about three or four of them i think are all in girl scouts and i feel obligated to at least get one box from <laughs> all of them and oh i love God, them i love girl scout cookies they're so good they are the best yeah I mean, you know, yeah, I immediately put like the peppermint ones in the freezer because that's the only way to eat them personally. 100%. Yeah. So I agree. That's way to do it. <laughs> so hippie chick you still play with, right? Or no? Yes. Yeah. Are they at the edge of kind of retirement a little bit or? No. I mean, they hopefully still have a few years in them. Mm -hmm. Hopefully about two. So we'll see. Just out of curiosity, I don't think I've ever asked anyone this question because unlike thoroughbred horses, you know, I feel like polo ponies, even the guys on our team, you know, the Oak Brook polo team, I mean, there, there's ponies out there that are in their 20s and they're playing. Yeah. What is the career length of a polo pony? I think it ranges, honestly, from whatever horse you have. It's a matter of how the heart on that horse for me. In my opinion, I don't obviously go off a little bit of the age, but I go off of when I feel like the horse isn't isn't enjoying it. You know, they hit their peak and if they start coming down and when I feel like they're not giving me what they were, mm -hmm. I feel like it's their time to retire. Got it. So like you said, it's heart. You know, if their heart's not in it, you can really tell. Exactly. And if they don't enjoy it, it's not <laughs> not fun for them, you know? Yeah, no, but that's a good assessment. You know your horse is better than anyone. Yeah. I think they just come to a point to where they don't want to play at that level anymore. And that might be to where they go and they teach a kid how to play polo. You know what I yeah, mean? I think yeah. they never don't want to be without attention and stuff like that. But whether it's their next life is a broodmare to breed or whether to teach another little kid how to ride or mm -hmm. do something, you know? Yeah. But there comes a point to where they aren't able to play at that level. And I think that even goes with any athlete, to be honest. It's just, you exactly. know, after a certain time, it gets so exhausting and it's draining. And it's no longer fun anymore. You might not feel like you're winning anymore and your body just can't take it. Like I'm a runner. You know, I was a hurdler. That would mean that I'm just going to do marathons or the occasional 5K now and then because <laughs> your body can't take hurdling anymore. Now, you played in some other sports. You're cheerleading. And you also did tennis. Now, tennis seems to be a relatively popular sport among some polo players. Jared Zenny, who was on my yeah. first podcast, was an avid tennis player as well. Is that kind of true with everyone for the most part? I mean, are there other tennis players out there in the polo world? 
Yes, I think tennis is definitely very popular in the polo world. Tennis and golf. I personally am not a great golf player. Don't know what's going on with that, but I'm not very good. No, but tennis, I think it's it's all hand eye, you know, and so I think it's a good way to go get exercise, have a good time that you're not on the field and working the horses, but it's a good way to go and meet up with friends and still do something with exercise, you know? Yeah, you're all using the same hand, hitting it back and forth, exactly. backhand, forward hand. It keeps that arm strong, that's for sure. Probably same hand grip. <laughs> exactly. I think it comes a little natural. <laughs> so Yeah. The players up here are avid golfers. They actually go out a lot. So I don't think any I've seen anyone play tennis. Well, that's exciting stuff. So what is the future for you? What do you got planned this year in 2022? And what are your goals for like the next five years? Where do you see yourself? So right now I'm playing a few tournaments here in Wellington. And I'm playing an eight goal with my brother in February. And then I'll be playing a 12 goal with Sarah Magnus. And then I'm going to play the Women's U.S. Open again with Gunda, so Sarah Magnus. And so I'm very excited for that. And then the next five years, oof, I think I just want to continue to improve my string and improve my game every day. I mean, if I can learn something new every day, I'm happy. I don't wouldn't necessarily say I have a goal that I want to reach in the next five years is as much as just continue to push myself mm -hmm. every day and to improve in every way that I can. Is there a particular area of your game that continues to need work? Is there an area where you can like, I need to constantly work on this. I got to get better. I got to get better. It's like a basketball player. He can easily go to the right of the, the hoop, but he's got to work on his left hand and go to the left of the hoop. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like it's everything. Penalties, I practice a lot. What I think is so beautiful about the sport of polo is that you can honestly learn something new every time you go out on the field. Mm -hmm. Whether it's something that you didn't know about horsemanship or just something about your game. Everyone has different ways of doing something, whether it's a different way of hitting a penalty, a way that they aim, or different way of hitting a next shot. You have to find out what works for you. So you it's kind of trial and error. You know, you have to try everything and figure out what works for you. And then you develop yourself as a player. Mm -hmm. And not just physically, but mentally as well. I got to imagine, like, you know, you're 18 years old. You haven't been in the game as much as some of these other guys who have played it so frequently. They can have eyes in the back of their head. They, they can anticipate the reactions of others and see how a play ultimately formulates. That's why they say it's like chess on horseback. But that's good to hear. So the, your whole entire game needs to constantly be perfected yeah who's primarily uh, coaching you is it your dad yes yeah, so my dad and my mom help me out a lot mm -hmm. I mean my mom hits penalties with me all the time and no they're both always at my games and trying to help me out in every way that they can what what is it about the penalty shot that you know you have to work on is it the fact that like like all the attentions on you sort of thing for me I feel like everyone has different issues with their penalties some it's mental when they're going up to two and three when no one's defending it you know some get like i don't know if it's nervous or like oh i have to make this you know yeah for me that's never really my issue is as much as mine is i like to focus on the aim and trying to be able to lift the ball up and get it off the ground mm -hmm. so that's basically what i work on is my accuracy and being able to make it undefended for like a 60 yard shot or something it's like hitting free throws man yeah, get out there, <laughs> you, you know, shoot them. 50 of them every or 100 of them every day just to knock them in. That's for exactly. sure. Same same mentality, right. it seems like. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, the game was on the line or something. It should be a no brainer. Yeah. You know, you should be able to walk up to it knowing you're making it. And so that's it should be automatic. And so I think that's why so many people practice that all the time. I feel like in polo, you know, games are won and lost on penalty shots. 100 percent. Yeah. This April, the sporting world will be celebrating a momentous milestone as the Lexus International Gay Polo Tournament, presented by Douglas Elliman, returns for its 12th year from April 6th through the 10th. The International Gay Polo Tournament was founded in 2010 and the event has grown in popularity, creativity, and impact with nearly 3,000 players, attendees, and merrymakers from around the world attending the event annually. The event was created to generate awareness and to move the needle forward for LGBTQ athletes, 
and to ensure athletes not only have the same opportunities, but also have a safe place to learn, grow, and excel in their sport. Since its inception, the priority has remained to raise a significant amount of money in support of diversity and inclusion initiatives for other LGBTQ organizations. Since becoming a 501c3 organization, the GPL has donated over 30,000 to organizations such as Compass Youth Program and SAGE. This year's event will benefit One Pulse Foundation, an organization born after the tragic events that unfolded at Pulse Nightclub, where 49 people lost their lives in 2016. One Pulse Foundation's mission is to create a sanctuary and build a national LGBTQ museum to honor the victims. This year's event will be marked with full slate of activities and will celebrate with fun, fashion, and of course, polo. The five days of festivities will come to a head in a majestic match only rivaled by the creative competitions from the tailgaters when the event returns to the International Polo Club Palm Beach in Wellington, Florida. To learn more about this year's event and to purchase tickets, please visit www.gaypolo.com. Thank you for your support and we look forward to seeing you at this year's must attend event. Now, here's a question that has come up, especially with some of the players that I've interviewed, is the difference between the pace of play or the culture of play in the United States versus Argentina. Do you see a distinct play difference between the two? Definitely. So I believe like now that I've gone and played tournament there, I definitely see it more. You know, here I feel like it's very much you stop, you set up a play, you know the fouls inside and out so that you can set yourself up for a foul or not foul, you know? And so it's a lot of more thinking here, I feel like. Whereas in Argentina, it's very much only reaction. You don't think as much as you just do it. I always joke, I mean, it's not like this, but I always joke, I'm like, basically whoever gets to the ball first in Argentina has the line. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's not a matter of if the line was there or not. And so that's kind of the way I feel like the umpires let them play a little more in Argentina, where here it's different, you know? Whereas in Argentina, they can call it like that. I feel like they have their reasons. There, it's more for man polo. And so, I mean, I think it's just different, the, everything about it there. So there's definitely a big difference between the two. Mm-hmm. And, and different as in better? Or, you know, is it something that you hope that American polo kind of evolves into in a way? No. For me, I like the difference. I wouldn't say I prefer either one. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, I've grown up playing here. No, I don't think that necessarily we need to change as much as it's different. They call it different there. And I mean, they call it different in the UK as well, you know? And so every place is different. Maybe it's different style of horses as well, you know? Mm -hmm. We don't have that horse flush here. We have a different style. And so I don't think as much as that we need to change is that it's just, it's different. And when you go somewhere, you have to adapt and it's preference. You know, some people might enjoy playing those rules in Argentina and, No, and you're right. Like you even mentioned the UK. I've heard, you know, oh, the UK players, especially an arena player. I mean, they're much more hardcore and way more physical in the UK than they're here in the United States. And in Argentina, like, I don't really think they play a lot of arena polo. Do they? No. No. I don't think (laughs) at all. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. You can tell the difference between just a player from where they're from. Exactly. That's kind of neat that there is that cultural difference in a way, the, cu- the culture of play, if you will, exactly. um, that revolves around different countries. You're getting into different tastes of everything. That's It's not necessarily all universal. And maybe that's a good thing, that it isn't all universal. You're forced to adopt and evolve into a different style of play, if you will. And maybe that's what adds another level of challenge to you know, the game of polo. So that's not the mental game. It's just not the physical game. It's not the horse. But also you're managing the different styles of play in different cultures throughout the entire world. Yeah. You could go to India, you could go to Singapore, you can go to Africa and see how do they play down there? How do they play in New Zealand? You know, everything is just kind of adapted. It's like someone's accent in a way. Oh, that's how you play. You're clearly from New Zealand if you play like that. So true. And I think that that's also why they had to do the handicaps differently is because the style is different. So if you go there and you can't adapt to just reacting and you having to think then, then you're not going to be rated as high, you know? And That's a good point. Like, so yeah, some of the, you know, even Jared Zenny or Fred Mannix, I think their handicap is different than the United States than it yeah. is in Argentina. I think it's a separate one. I think Jared Zenny's a six here and he's a seven down there. Yes. 
and and you think like oh you know there you think it would almost be the reverse in some way you know argentina which is like the apex in terms of countries when it comes to the sport of polo that you know they might be have more scrutiny in terms of what your handicap is but i think it honestly just comes down to the player because like you yeah. said you know a lot of players who either they're a goal up there or they're a goal lower here the american yeah, yeah it can change <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting topic because you could bring it up in so many other different sports, especially here in the United States. I always, coming from mainstream sports, it's always the comparison between Big Ten football versus SEC football. There's this distinct style in terms of how the game is played. You know, in the Big Ten, you got corn fed big guys on the line. You know, when you go down there, it doesn't seem all that much like that. And it's a huge passing and running game, a lot of different styles and cultures. And I'm sure there's plenty of other examples out there. That's for sure. Now you're young, you're 18 years old, you know, you've skyrocketed into the game. Are there things in terms of, you know, you observing the game from kind of the outside where you like to see polo go? Is it something that you want to see it on TV more? Is there something in women's polo that specifically should be doing that's not doing now? I completely agree. I know you and I have talked about it a lot as of sponsorships in the sport. I think that that's somewhere that's one of the next steps for for Polo is to get more sponsorship from the outside, you know, whether it's cars or accessories or just different brands. Mm -hmm. I think that that would definitely be one of the next steps in Polo. But to be honest, I feel like every year Polo is growing for the better, you know, and it's trial and error. You have to see what works and what doesn't like anything. Women's Polo has grown so much. I mean, it continues every year just to grow a tremendous amount. And so I think, honestly, I can't even think of where it's going to be in five years. Next, I feel like doesn't grow as fast because it's been around for a long time, you know, and why fix something that isn't broken? So I feel like it takes a little while for them to develop something. But no, for women's polo, it's unsure where it's going to be in five years. I mean, it's the, the amount that it's grown already is incredible. And so, so yeah, I don't know. Well, I guess you and I will just have to wait and see. <laughs> There's so many areas that we can talk about in terms of commercialization of the sport, being televised, and even as an athlete, you know, individuals like yourself who are making a career out of it, you know, you're obviously very highly dependent upon, you know, migrating to different polo seasons throughout the world and being hired on teams and so on and so forth. And you're having to take care of your string of ponies, which is a lot of work to do and hire your grooms. It's a very, very expensive hobby in addition to a profession. There's even discussions around, well, how can athletes better market themselves, which is a universal issue. It's not necessarily dedicated to polo, but it, it, it crosses barriers between amateur sports and Olympic sports. You know, people who can't get endorsements deals during the Olympics and so on and so forth. You know, some of these you know, curling athletes, for example, are accountants and real estate agents, and they happen to be on the world class stage when it comes to the sport of curling. You know, it's um, yeah. it's crazy, but to perfect your craft and put the time that you need into it, you know, it's it's very time consuming. It's very expensive. And athletes such as yourself, you know, it's ideal to look for that secondary type of income and have to develop brands around themselves to make them attractive to endorsements and so on very and so true. forth. And in my opinion, I feel like polo athletes are ripe for that. And now you have it being the courts handing down the fact that now collegiate athletes can go out and seek their own endorsement deals and what have you is a very, very big deal for people your age. I hope, I mean, it's, it opens a door because now those brands are looking for young athletes and, you know, targeting that other type yeah. of demographic. And I also feel as though, you know, from the polo player side of things, I think there's a lot more brand opportunities than what people perceive polo to be, which is very, pomp and circ with the champagne and the Vouv Clico and all that kind of stuff. Well, frankly, if you're in the player's corner, they're all about Dodge Ram trucks and a good pair of fitting jeans, you know, it's, it's kind of night and day. <laughs> Definitely. I feel like it's seen a little bit different, but you know, they see the beauty in it, which is great, but you know, that's the least thing that we're worried about. It's, it's the matter of the horse preparation, you know, like you said, everything it's more the dirty work that we're worried about. <laughs> Exactly. And if there's a way to put a little extra cash in your back pocket while continuing to focus on your craft and, you know, your team, a.k.a. your ponies, which require a lot of attention. And for players, you know, there is a very, very heavy bond between a player and its ponies. That's for dang sure. hundred percent. They're your children. But yeah, I mean, 
I think it, the industry is ripe for those opportunities and hopefully the little push brands will, will, will jump on it. They're always looking for that unique story they can attach themselves. Not to mention, you know, you look back at, and I had this conversation with Oliver Godard, the, who with the, the Polo Ryder Cup. And um, we talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, there's some brands that sports wouldn't be where they are today unless it wasn't for a sponsor. You know, where would skateboarding be without Mountain Dew? Where would they be without Vans who created their own shoe dedicated to such a niche sport? You know, the U.S. Polo ASSN, who I'm a brand ambassador for, has helped the USBA, I felt like, a ton. They really give back to the sport that we all love. And so yeah. I think that that's something that's really special about the brand as well. It's very critical. We need all the help we can get. And yeah, it's, it's very critical. I mean, there's plenty, uh, plenty of examples of that that are out there in the industry. And, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I used to work for an agency that observed the industry for these exact reasons. And even coaching sponsors, the buyer, to be like, look, you know, if there's an interested demographic or sport that you want to be in, go in there, not just thinking, where can I put my brand, but essentially sit down and talk to the organization and say, what do you need to be successful? Because if they're successful, you're successful. 100% I agree. So it's a, it's a business transaction instead of a marketing transaction. So last question for anyone, especially your age, Hope, especially your age, anyone who is interested in the sport or have a love for, for horses. What would you tell that person why you love the sport and why you should get involved in it? You know, for me, the sport of polo is absolutely incredible. I mean, it's a tough lifestyle, but it is the best, in my opinion. And if you love animals and you love horses and you want a sport that you will continue to learn every single day and you get an adrenaline rush like like no other, I mean, something that will always keep you busy. No matter what, you never know. It's always unknown with horses what's going to happen. And so you'll learn new things, whether it's how to doctor them or how to work with them to make them go better. You'll always learn something every day if you're open-minded. And you can really make it your own. You can have your own style of play. And that's what's really special. And you can play as a family, which is something that is very unique. And so it's a family sport and wherever you go, you're always going to find someone, you know, or, you know, through someone else, you know, and really, I can't say enough things, great things about the sport. And if you're wanting to try it, you should definitely try it. I mean, you can start polo at any age and, you know, whether you just want it to be a hobby, a weekend thing, or you want to really make it your profession, then you work hard and you do it. It's something that you can spend every day. You can spend every day at the barn. And no matter where you are, whether you're the best, you're still going to learn things. And so I think if you're interested in polo, you should try it and see, see where it takes you because you might be surprised. Yeah, that's great. Very, very wise words from an 18 year old. <laughs> Thank you. Like my daughter who's six sometimes spew them out. It's just like, who are you? <laughs> yeah, are you are you 40 you're telling me how to run my life now but hope i strongly appreciate you thank you so much for coming on uh and sharing your background your goals as a player where you've been you're doing amazing things out there you're kicking butt i mean i hate to say that all eyes are on you but they appear to be that way there's a lot of love for you hope out there that's for sure across the globe it's exciting to see what you're doing for the sport of polo and for women's polo out there and keep up the great work that's for sure well thank you and daniel thank you so much for having me i'm so lucky to be a part of the outside the boards podcast so i appreciate you having me on excellent well we'll talk to you soon hope and good luck to you this season and the rest of the year thank you so much bye that was a great episode what is the one thing you learned from today's conversation if this episode had an impact on you in some way, then I encourage you to visit and subscribe to our website at OutsideTheBoards.com for more episodes and interviews with incredible guests. Thanks for stopping by, my friends, and hope to see you on the polo field.